this is, I call it my pet session. Um, every year I try to pick sessions that, um, that you probably may not expect to see here. And things that, um, I mean, yesterday was uh, loud mouth patients making noise and making change, bringing e-patients to, uh, to CES. And this year I thought, God, I've been doing this for four years or five, I don't even know yet. And uh, is digital health saving lives yet? And um, we know, you know, obviously technology has been saving lives for a long time. But, you know, what, what are the real personal stories? So I got this, you know, bee in my bonnet where I had to do it. So um, I'm very, very excited this year. I have brought uh, five different stories and they are powerful, diverse, um, innovative, exciting. We have patients, we have people, physicians using technology to save lives. Um, for me, this is this is my session, so uh, I wanna introduce uh, Bonnie Britton, who's gonna be talking about ideal life with a, a lovely man uh, who's, who's utilizing the technology. Let them go, thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I, I guess all of you can tell I'm from the South. Um, we're from Eastern North Carolina. It was funny yesterday, someone came up to me and said, are you from England? And I said, really? With this accent? I don't think so. So, um, but we're really thrilled to be here today. Um, this is Mr. Arthur Tyson. He is one of our telehealth patients. And Mr. Tyson, um, tell us all how old you are. I'm 70 years old. Okay, and how are you feeling today? Well, today I feel fine. Okay. Now, you haven't always felt so fine in the past. Tell us a little bit about um, your health over the last few years. Well, over the last few years, I, I can't say that I, you know, feel bad. Mm -hmm. But I feel better now since I got the fibrillating in than I did before. Well, before you put this in, I didn't see no changes in myself okay. and, and didn't feel bad, didn't feel sick. And okay. I thought it was just normal. All right. Until I got up and went to work. I got up to one morning, checked my blood pressure, weighed myself, and it all went back to the hospital. And I went on to my job, you know, because I was feeling good. I got to my job, got a phone call. I got the phone call with the nurse, and she was telling me, asking me how was I feeling. So I told her, I said, I feel fine. I feel just fine. She said, no, Mr. Tyson, sir, you can't be feeling just fine. I said, ma'am, it's just a do. I feel just fine. She said, no. She said, no, no, no. I said, what are you doing now? I said, I'm talking to you on the phone now. <laughs> so, so she said, so she told me, she said, you hang up the phone right now. I said, you go to the doctor. So I hung the phone up. I started one time not to go. Cause I was feeling all right, you know. Started not to go, and, and something got in mind, so you better go here. She might know what she's talking about. And I said to my supervisor, I said, I got to go to the doctor, and I'll be right back. When I got to the doctor, he checked me out, and I looked at him, I said, I'm ready to go back now. And I said, I told my supervisor I'd be back in a little bit. He said, sorry. Got like that, I said, sorry. You ain't going back today. So then he asked me, he said, Where's your driver? I want to talk to your driver. I said, you talking to him? He shook his head at me and said, you're a lucky man. And you want a lucky man. So I asked him why. He said, you know your pulse is down to 20. So you could have went out any time. Yeah, his heart rate was down to 20. His blood pressure was going up. The nurse had seen this over several days, but not so as dramatically. And because his nurse was on top of it and right. had a good relationship with him. She was able to yeah, tell him right. that he needed to go to the mm -hmm. hospital. Now, tell everybody a little bit about, we, we placed equipment in Mr. Tyson's home oh, yes. by yeah. Ideal Life, and every morning he gets up and he has a routine, and I wanted him to share a little bit about what that routine is. Oh, yes, that routine was I get up every morning, I had to weigh, and I had to check my blood pressure. And this way, I give Ms. Beverly so Beverly's the nurse. I that. give her so much credit for that because if it hadn't been for her on top of it, I don't know, I don't know what would happen. Because like I told you, I won't feel no symptoms. Right. So every morning he gets up, he checks his blood pressure, he does his weight, 
And then we have a nurse who monitors that data. And anytime that data is out off, then they call the patient directly and, and right. to conduct an assessment mm -hmm. of them. And since you've been having the Ideal Life equipment in and checking your blood pressure and your pulse and your weight every day, do you feel safer? Do you feel... Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I feel safe. Uh, I hate it when you took it out. You know, I, it won't sit. Uh, you want it, you yeah, want it back? It, yeah, I want to check it. Check okay. It, check, check my blood pressure anyway every morning. Okay. And do you feel like that what um, doing this, these readings and being in this program helped save your life? I feel that way. Yes, I do. Okay, because you, you know, were having no symptoms. You know, according to the doctor, I feel it saved my life because he said my heart was down to twenty, and that was thought like that was actually too low, and, but I didn't ever feel it. You know, right? So that's why I said okay. that the uh, system works well. Okay, good. Yeah, really good. All right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share, Mr. Tyson? We're so pleased that you're here and sharing well, your story. Well, I'm glad to share it with the people. So that's what happened. It's, it might happen to some of those. I think, that's you know? exactly right. Yeah. And living in eastern North Carolina, we're very rural. And one of the things that's very difficult for patients is to be able to go to the doctor and have transportation and the money to be able to go to the doctor. Well, one thing I can tell them, you don't make a difference how you feel, have yourself checked out. Because cause I sure was feeling fine. Okay. And no symptoms. Very good. Well, um, Mr. Tyson um, is going to be catching a plane right after this, but if anybody would like to ask us any questions, we'd love to meet you outside. And um, if not, if any of you have any questions, please mm -hmm. feel free to contact me, um, Bonnie Britton, and um, we'll be more than happy to, to share and, and talk about the program and what we've done. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. Great so job. nice that he flew all this way for this. Very, very nice. So I want to invite up on, on stage <clears throat> um, Masatake Ito, Director, Managing Executive Officer uh, for AMD Company, and also a Continual Health Alliance member. Oh, thank you, Jill. Good morning. I'm the uh, director of a Japanese uh, multi-industry company and the headquarter Tokyo in Japan. Uh, A&D has been a pioneer in the development of evolution of the uh, uh, personal biomedics uh, monitoring for connected health. Uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about our experience uh, realizing the power of connected health, which saved the lives of many people. Let's see. Okay. As uh, many of you know, a large earthquake of magnitude 9.0 took place in East, East Japan on March 11, 2011. This, followed by tsunami, caused one of the largest natural disasters in recent history. Maybe I, I clicked something different. Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, tsunami caused major death and disruption in most of the cities along the coastline of East Japan. In the center of this slide is a, a five-story hospital which tsunami flooded, uh, killing 70% of the patient and the staff in Minami Sanrikucho, where our recent uh, rescue effort took place. Uh, Minami Sanrikucho, a beautiful tourist area in the middle of National Park, had 5% of the population dead or missing and 20% of the population evacuated after the disaster at that time. In, the, in disasters of this nature, many of the uh, deaths occur after they survive the disaster itself, which is called a disaster-related death. In case of the Great Hanshin earthquake, which 
took place in 1995, 14% of the victims passed away after they survived the disaster. So cardiovascular risk is one of the biggest risks leading to disaster-related death. The environmental, environmental and lifestyle changes brought by the disaster have a cumulative effect on one's blood pressure, which makes the blood pressure a great indicator of the individual health and uh, physical state. At the Minami San Rikcho, 1,500 people had to be evacuated at the city uh, arena after the disaster. Uh, medical needs shift from emergency medical treatment to uh, disease and condition management in the days following a disaster. For that reason, a disaster medical support team from Jichi Medical University reached out to A&D and other members of a continua in Japan to help organize a special support team for the evacuees. Thanks to the help of the, these members and the interoperability of a continua, we are able to uh, uh, set up a monitoring system or we call a DCAP up and running within two weeks. And the driving force behind this DCAP team was Dr. Kazuomi Kario of Jichi Medical School. And Dr. Kario was himself a survivor of the Great Hanshin earth Earthquake, which took place in 1995. Therefore, his theme was, how can we save the lives of the survivors? The mission of the DCAP team is to monitor the blood pressure of the evacuees remotely and provide advice to the medical staff at the disaster site. Uh, this is the system design for the evacuation camp. Uh, blood pressure is taken by oneself at the evacuation camp. And it is wirelessly sent via Bluetooth to a 3G hub together with the patient ID and uploaded to the cloud server located in Tokyo. The data are monitored and analyzed by medical professionals at Dichi University located 150 miles from the evacuation camp. From there, professionals provide detailed care directions to the doctors at the temporary hospital at the disaster site. And the local, uh, local medical staff have a face-to-face -face meeting at the evacuation camp and give advice. And this shows all the devices used for the uh, system, or DCAP. Uh, actually, seven companies work together, donating devices and giving support for the system. And wireless BP kiosk type unit, uh, patient ID card reader with near field communication, and patient ID cards provided, and hub to send data via three, uh, 3G, and the cloud server, and various uh, web applications for data viewing and decision support. All those are created for, the, for this rescue effort. And uh, some photos from the care team at work. Uh, first on the left, face-to-face uh, -face meeting with the evacuees since they lost all the medical record by tsunami. So they have to re recreate the medical record. Medical staff meeting after the uh, days of work and the medical e examination took place actually on the floor. Some of the guys worked on the DCAP system installation at the evacuation camp. I visited the site uh, afterward and I got some comments from the doctor who worked on, on at the temporary uh, hospital. And just a few comments. Many were encouraged to live and very few died. The system gives real-time coordination with Dr. Carrillo's uh, medical staff. And the system gives an easy to identify high-risk patient. And all this can eliminate unnecessary health exams, which is a great benefit because of the shortage of medical staff. And what we learned uh, from this DCAP activity is timely response not only important, but also plays a very important role in motivating evacuees. And interoperability, we found, is key for reliable system operation. 
and Continental Health Alliance in that case has proved to be most powerful and economical in, for creating such ecosystems. And DCAP system is one of the earliest deployments of the continuous ecosystem which saved the lives of many people. And disaster related toll at uh, Minami Sanrikucho was one third of the nation average, nationwide average. And these are some photos from the uh, Minami Sanrikucho. And these are uh, very scenic places they have but with the people's will and support, the beautiful scenery and heartwarming people of East Japan will return, I believe. Thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Terry and Claudia. You guys ready? Many of you probably know them already, but I think the story is pretty powerful. So. Um, you guys have a seat. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to ask Claudia to start off and talk about CGM and diabetes well, on a personal basis. Thank you. But I, I need to back up and say that Terry and I have known each other for about 20 years now. <laughs> um, and we worked together at a, at a prior company, and we sold the company, and Terry retired and then went to work at Dexcom. And about five years ago, I retired as well, luckily, thank you. <laughs> and Terry called me up and he said, Claudia, I want you to try this Dexcom CGM. And I was very familiar with CGM. And just as a little background, I have type 1 diabetes, insulin dependent. I've had it for 35 years. And I have been in the technology game the entire time with advanced therapies. So I drive down to San Diego. I tried the device. And I was so floored because it worked. And it was simple and accurate and reliable. And to somebody with diabetes, you know, nobody wants to be hooked up to continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pump. We don't choose to do that. But to be able to find a device that was so simple and user friendly that I trusted it, that was over five years ago. And I committed myself to increasing access for this product because it is so life saving. And I have to tell you that it's so rewarding, you know, to be with Terry and to be committed to this. And we get letters from patients, and, and you know, people seek me out all the time because they know I'm a diabetic, and they say, why didn't my doctor tell me about this? Why did I wait so long before I go on it? So from a personal standpoint, I find this very rewarding, and it is life-saving. And, and, and I just want to say one thing is that diabetes, insulin-dependent diabetes, it's not an emergency every now and then. It's every day. Every day can be life-threatening when you take insulin. And for kids and seniors and people with type 1 awareness, if they take a couple units off, that could kill them. So I wear this device 24-7. It's the only device that I will absolutely insist that I have on my body at all times because it does save my life every day. Well, that's great. I mean, our, our pursuit is to take some of the mystery out of diabetes, as Claudia mentioned, it's a conundrum. It's not just the food that you eat, the insulin that you take. It can be stressors, physical stress, mental stress, and this mystery of glycemic variability and the dangers of it, both high and low, continue to be this conundrum for patients. Our goal as a company is to simplify it. Uh, we can say things like stay between the lines because we port this information continuously to a handheld receiver. In the next generation, if you stop by our booth here at uh, Digital Health, you'll see the, the pending uh, product before, pending before the FDA right now is called a share system. So we take the receiver that Claudia has that she uses every day, we plug it into a module that has low uh, energy Bluetooth and we port that information to a phone adjacent and that phone then can, through a push notification, deliver it to five, up to five followers. What does that mean, five followers? Well, it's individuals that care about the individual with diabetes. And so as an example, the simplest form is a child at school. So if the parents can be at work and reading what the child's glucose level is along with trends and alarms, or a spouse or a significant other that is traveling. And all of this is available. It's, it's all through this digital health explosion and this convergence of healthcare into the utilities that we use every day. 
and it won't be too long before we port it directly to the phone. There are some regulatory challenges from the Food and Drug Administration. We're a class three medical device, highly regulated, but the opportunities exist, and I think the Food and Drug Administration is moving as quickly as they can in order to understand the risks and the mitigation of that risk. But it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Again, our goal is to simplify. People with diabetes have multiple gadgets that they have to embrace every day. And they do get equipment fatigue, unfortunately, because there are no holidays with diabetes. There's no vacations. Every day, Claudia has to do multiple transactions to stay alive. And our goal is to simplify that. And unfortunately, all you have to do is pick up the newspaper and understand that we're at least at an epidemic stage, if not a pandemic stage, with respect to diabetes. Almost 30 million people just afflicted here in the United States. One out of every three children born every single day in the United States will develop diabetes at some point in their life. A third of our population uh, for the future. And it's now approaching over 335 million globally and expected to cross over half a billion in the next 15 years. So the things that we can do until there is a cure, and as Claudia mentioned, we've been chasing this now for over 20 years. I can't stand up here and, and tell you that if I, I know when a cure is gonna happen. I'd love to be out of business, but I don't think I'm gonna be anytime soon. We're in 20 artificial pancreas projects as a company, trying again to close the loop to make diabetes a little bit less mysterious. But until that day comes, our goal is to develop these tools in which to simplify the mystery of, of diabetes and, and make it more user-friendly for patients so that they too can live as fulfilling life as you get to experience each and every day. So again, stop by our booth. We've got a lot of technology we can talk to you. Thank you very much. And, and you know, I, maybe I should just back up and give a simple example of how this works. The patient. I'm going to show you my abdomen, which was not the intention this morning. Um, but I, I put it in here. It's a simple patient uh, inserted device about the size of two human hairs. A little wire goes into the subcutaneous tissue. I attach a transmitter, and it communicates to this every five minutes. So I set my targets, and I say, I really want to stay between 70 and 150. And if I go outside of that range, it alarms me. So if I don't detect a low blood glucose, it wakes me up in the nighttime. Or if I'm going high, it tells me and I'll take more insulin. So to be able to have that degree of information about what's going on, that is what allows for success. It's all the knowledge. And people with diabetes, you know, they say, well, I check my finger and, you know, I don't want to deal with it or, you know, that's the wrong approach. You need to have the information, then you decide how to treat it. And it's, it's quite simple and very straightforward, but it really is life-saving. Fantastic. Thank you so Thanks. much for sharing your story. Thank you. It's getting better. I'm so excited. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Meester to the stage. Dr. Meester is an osteopathic family physician program director at St. John Providence Health System. You know, by now, we've gotten used to the idea that technology impacts medical care in some amazing ways. We've heard some amazing stories. And it's easy to focus on how technology can be applied in very critical situations. Um, I'm a family physician in Southeast Michigan, and I've never had the opportunity to triage after a disaster like Hurricane Sandy or what happened in Japan. I've never massaged a beating heart while awaiting a life flight chopper in the field. Well, my operations are smaller sewing up a laceration, removing a BB from a teenager's leg, less time consuming, and decidedly less complex than those of a neurosurgeon who can rely on complex 3D imaging to determine the best approach to stop an encroaching brain tumor. I have an AED in my office, a defibrillator, and uh, I know how to use it, but uh, I've had the unfortunate good luck to have no patient go into a fatal arrhythmia in my office, so I don't set, uh, get to use that. And sadly, I don't think Gray's Anatomy is going to be calling me any time to be a consultant for their show. 
I'm fine with that, though, because I know that what I have to offer as a physician is just as critical. And I'd like to tell you today two stories about how digital technology has not only saved my life, but the lives of patients in my office and others across the country every day. A perfect example um, was one of my patients who came in a few months ago. She has a history of cardiac and autoimmune diseases, specifically lupus. For those of you who know a little bit about medicine, you know that lupus is a very challenging disease. It can have many manifestations. She's on a lot of medications, somewhere between 10 and 12 medications for the management of her high blood pressure, her diabetes, and her lupus. And when she came in to see me, her cardiologist had just put her on a new medication for her blood pressure. But she didn't remember the name of the medication, and she didn't have it with her. During our office visit, I happened to have my smartphone with me, and I had an application on it that probably many of you are aware of called Hippocrates. Hippocrates is a reference that has replaced our, our print pharmacopoeia that many of us doctors use. But one of the cool things about it is that it has a pill ID feature. And I was able to have the patient describe to me what her pill looked like and what, it, what imprints were on each side and whether it was scored. And I was able to identify what the medication was. And then I could also take that same product and I was able to check that against the other 13 medications that she was on. Well, what I found out was that the medication her cardiologist had just put her on was likely to decrease her renal function significantly, but more importantly, it was going to cause a lupus reaction in a certain population of patients. Not good for a patient who has pre-existing lupus. I called her cardiologist and I asked, could we change this medication to a different one, which I had found that didn't have any of these interactions. And he was absolutely in favor of that. But he was very surprised. He, pr he, he prides himself on being very current. And he didn't realize the medication he'd put her on could interact with the other one she was on. But why would he? We have literally thousands of medications out there. And for the average physician in the field, it's hard for us to keep up with them and keep them all straight in our minds. You know, I'd love to tell you this story is unique and unusual. But the fact of the matter is, it's so common, physicians don't even give the technology a second thought, despite the fact that every day, literally hundreds of potentially life-threatening reactions and interactions are prevented by digital health apps and other technologies. You know, it's a given, as I said, that digital health technology in my life is beneficial. As a practicing physician, I interact with technology so continuously, it's, it's, I don't even give it a second thought. It's just constant. And sometimes we forget the personal impact that such technology can make on an individual. I was reminded of this fact in 2007 when digital health became very personal for me and probably saved the life of someone very important to me. And that's my newborn daughter, Asha. So my daughter, Asha, when she was born, she had a significant allergy to milk, but we didn't know that. It wasn't until we started to switch her over to formula that it became evident something was very, very wrong. She would become extremely angry, red in the face, screaming and literally shaking, her entire body shaking every time we gave her formula. At first we thought, it's gotta be just the taste, babies are like that, I'd seen plenty of young babies that were that way. And so we started to titrate the formula. We took an eight ounce bottle and we put seven and a half ounces of breast milk into the bottle and only a half ounce of formula. But it didn't work, she would scream, she would get angry, she would fight. And I was starting to worry now that maybe she did have an allergy because I've had lifelong allergies. The problem is Asha was only about six months old at this point and she was too young to test with traditional methods of exposing her skin to potential allergens. To be honest, I wasn't enthused about the idea either. It hurts and it's very traumatic. If any of you have ever been tested for allergies, the basic process is usually you have the person lay on their back, you take anywhere from 30 to 50 needles and you scratch their back with allergy allergens and then you just wait to see if they start to have reactions. As you can imagine, for uh, a child, one, two, three years old, that's an incredibly traumatic thing to do. Um, and I know, because I had it done three times as a child. Um, so what was I gonna do about this? Well, one of the good things is that I have access through the digital technology and my ability to access literature much more quickly and without having to go to a specialist. And I was able to go and look up some of the literature on allergen testing. And there had been new serum allergen testing that had come out that was extremely sensitive that could bypass a lot of the problems that happen in testing very young children under one year of age. And I thought that would be able to help us solve our mystery. We ordered the testing on my daughter and we were able to diagnose her accurately with a milk allergy, a soy allergy, and an egg white allergy. Fortunately, she wasn't allergic to rice or almonds. So we switched her to rice milk. I can tell you I was nervous 
very nervous the first day we tried it. She would lost weight since birth. She was in the fifth percentile for her height and weight. My doctor was getting concerned that we might need to start alternative feeding strategies, which are very challenging and very expensive. If she didn't turn around, I didn't know what we were going to do. My wife isn't a physician, and as you can imagine, she was incredibly stressed out. Seeing her firstborn child struggle to develop um, weight and height placed a huge psychological and emotional stress on us. Imagine our relief when she took that first bottle of rice milk and drank the whole thing in one gigantic gulp. Her weight, her height, her temperament improved dramatically. Um, and most importantly, I knew now what allergies I had to worry about with her. She's since grown out of the egg white and soy allergies. Milk and cheese are still a problem, but her allergy levels are decreasing. And because I can test her based on the information I found through digital technology, I know that she has a good chance of outgrowing these. So I was able to ensure the safety of my daughter. That's her today with her little sister. She's doing well. She's in the 95th percentile for her height and weight. And she is just as much of a troublemaker as you might imagine. <laughs> Digital health technology can be just as useful in its subtle forms as its dramatic ones. Each day, M Health and digital technology saves the lives of patients in the same way I do, by stopping disease from ever occurring and helping to stop errors in diagnosis and treatment before they can occur. As a primary care physician, I know that technology saves lives because it prevents problems from arising in the first place. When you consider that the leading cause of death related to medical problems, which is heart disease, is due to mostly preventable diseases, and that the latest data shows that deaths due to preventable errors such as diagnostic mistakes, failure to follow guidelines, and errors of omission account for almost 500,000 deaths annually. I'd argue that the greatest impact of technology isn't in the heroic or dramatic moments. It's in the promise of improved accuracy, decreased error, and proactive education of patients that happens every day in the offices of physicians and hospitals all over this country. And that is something that even the simplest doctor and most unassuming patient can understand and appreciate. Thank you so much for your time today. So we have a very uh, special next opportunity to um, to witness exobionics and um, a real personal story of how this <coughs> this suit this this device has has changed uh, a, an amazing man's life. So I'm going to welcome to the stage Nathan Harding, who's the co-founder and CEO of Exobionics, and um, Paul Thacker, who is their ambassador, will be um, joining us. Uh, momentarily. Hi, so uh, I'm Nathan Harding, CEO of Exobionics, and I'm incredibly privileged to uh, lead a team of superstars at our company. And a couple of people I want to introduce right now. Mike Glover over here standing up is one of our physical therapists. He's one of seven physical therapists we uh, employ in the company. And Paul Thacker is one of our ambassadors for the product, and I will let Paul uh, introduce himself and talk about himself a little. Thanks, sir. Um, well, again, my name is Paul Thacker. Born and raised in Alaska. No, it is not dark 24 hours a day in the wintertime. And no, Sarah Palin and I are not friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have been a professional snowmobiler for the better part of, gosh, it's pushing 12, 15 years now. And about just a little over three years ago, while training, I had a crash and left me without the use of my legs. Now, granted, you know it's a it's a huge, life-changing experience that you it, it's it's hard to describe unless you're in the position that I'm in right now. But I was fortunate enough to do my rehab at Craig Hospital in Denver, and so I was there about a month. Went out, did my thing in the world, but. Five months later, I got a call from my therapist at Craig, and she asked if I'd be interested in walking again. Obvious answer, yeah, right? So Craig was actually one of the first hospitals to trial, uh, at the time it was E-Legs, now it's EXO. And so I jumped at the chance, went back, was there a week, I got to get up and cruise around, it was amazing. Now two and a half laters, or two and a half years later, here we are. All right, so 
while uh, Paul gets into the exoskeleton, which we call EXO, I will um, talk a little about the company. So at Exobionics, we actually see the world as facing a gigantic wave of human augmentation that's coming. And this is um, getting very exciting because of the IT revolution has now really enabled us to make a really rich interface between human and machine. And so we can get behaviors out of machines that make it possible for people to actually wear robotics now. And what we are at the forefront of this wearable robotics movement, and it's, it's going to get more and more exciting. I mean, human augmentation so far has been about things like hearing and things like this. But now you're going to see people running faster. You're going to see them jumping higher. And it's all going to culminate, I think, for me when you see grandma at the mall showing off her new EXO pants that are the hip way that she gets to take a walk with her grandkids that otherwise she'd just be way too tired to do. And um, so uh, to tell you a little bit about us, we actually started out of the military space. We made human exoskeletons to carry loads uh, for soldiers, which we still do actually with Lockheed Martin. They have a product called Hulk, which we developed for them. We also work on industrial applications of human exoskeletons that can, that can hold tools, heavy tools and things like that for people while they work in an environment where they can't really use any kind of wheeled vehicle or stand. Uh, and then on the medical side, we do what people are most excited about, and that's that we get people up and walking. And um, Paul Thacker, who's a paraplegic, he can get up and walking in the machine, and Mike will describe to you how it works and what it does in a case like his. But, uh, but I want to stress that, uh, what, that there's much more than just paraplegics that we work with. And in fact, uh, most patients that our machines are used on now are patients that have a neurological problem like a stroke or a traumatic brain injury. And they're going through a process that's been well known for a long time called gait training, where you retrain them how to walk. And this device is allowing them to get patients up much earlier, who are much weaker than you could normally start to get practicing walking. And, um, and that's really the key to getting better outcomes from this technology. It allows them to give the patient a what we call a variable assist, where as they learn more and more how to walk, the, pay, the machine will provide less and less help at, for them. And it, it learns just how low it can lower it. And then the idea is they eventually walk out of the machine. Now, Paul is a great example of where the future will be, though. And that will be when it's not just about rehabilitation centers, and it's about um, selling exos to people like Paul that he can use in his daily life as part of his way to get around, as part of his way to socialize, and a way to improve his health. So with that, I will let these guys stand and give you a walk. OK, guys. So what, what I'm going to do now is so Paul's going to actually do a stand with the, with the device. It is a fully powered stand. There's actually uh, there's two motors at the hips and the knees. And if I push the button, it's going to stand. His job is just to keep his balance. Ready? One, two, three, we're standing. So Paul's legs are a little tight today <laughs> because uh, some of the results of spinal cord injury, you do have some tightness in your legs and the muscles. So we're working a little hard today to get that. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually a kind of a safety feature of the machine. Is the, and, and that's an important part of using a robot with a machine is that he has, he's having a condition called spasticity today that makes his legs want to move very slowly and they're kind of like cramped up. So the machine actually, it won't just overpower and break his legs. It will, you know, kind of take him up slowly and kind of move when his legs will let him move. Oh, this is so much nicer. <laughs> my, my legs like to do exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to do. When they're, when they're bent, they like to go straight. When they're straight, they like to bend. Such is the life I live in. <laughs> All right, so on Paul's right hand on the crutch, there's actually an interface that actually allows the user to control the walk cycle. He just engaged the cycle, and now he's going to hit a button under his fingertip, and it's automatically going to set for him. 
So what he's doing right now, his responsibility is I've set some targets. What he, what he needs to do is find the balance point over his foot to get his forward and lateral target. Once he hits those targets, the exo is automatically taking the step for him. And you can see just already some of the benefits of the standing. His, uh, his legs are starting to relax. His, his steps are becoming longer more, and more fluid. So yeah, what you saw there is that he pressed the button to get the first step to initiate and to arm the system. And from then on, it's all about watching his pose. And we basically watch for him to center his, his shoulders over that front foot. And then the machine knows he wants to take a step. When you see me stand like this, you know, hey, he wants to take a step. It's the same thing the robot does. So I mean, you don't, you don't really realize the things that you take for granted until they're taken away. Walking, standing, that's something you guys have been doing since before you can remember. <coughs> and, you know, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if EXO's necessarily saved my life at this point, but is it improving my quality of life? Absolutely. You know, I get to stand up, I get to have these face-to-face -face conversations, you know, just to, just to remember how tall you are. Those are really powerful mental healing type things that, you know, I, I don't get to do on a daily basis. So, uh, I mean, this technology is incredible. I think that we're just now scratching the surface of what I'm going to see down the road. And I'm super fortunate to be, you know, to be standing up here in front of you guys and, you know, part of this amazing company, amazing technology. And I'll be ready to run anytime you guys are ready to get me a suit that can run. <laughs> Andy's requested a. <laughs> well, Paul has also requested a snowmobile riding XO, which we've uh, been reluctantly <laughs> thinking about. Um, I, I, I just want to stress, we've made a company commitment to get a million people walking in our first 10 years in the medical market, and that clock started for us February 14th of 2012, so we're almost two years in. We've probably had about 2,000 people walk so far, and, and the curve is doing exactly what we need it to do to get to that million. And if you guys have any idea how you might help us achieve that goal, uh, please talk to us about it because we like to uh, include as many people as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.